Hello. Uh, good. Sounds like it's working. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the uh, you may all have known that I was working for Red Hat until January seventh. Uh, that's it was a wonder wonderful time working there. I had a great time, but um, uh, I felt like the Ada, the Ada initiative was something I wanted to do even more than that. So when I left Red Hat, they took away my laptop. <laughs> this is a, 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 a close-up of a repair. My cat knocked my laptop off the, uh, the desk, and so we ended up having to do the, ooh, I bet this thing has a little light. No, okay. I, I had a friend of mine do a <laughs> rivet the, the hinge back together. It's a little closer. <laughs> he managed to do that without breaking it, which is really stunning. and <laughs> Involves a lot of hammer work, so. Um, Unfortunately, I had to send that back home, and I really like my MacBook Air, but until uh, this morning around 11 a.m., it didn't have Linux on it, and I was gonna give a live demo today. So, uh, I'd like to give a little introduction <laughs> uh, about how to install Linux on the MacBook Air, just because now I have all of this useless knowledge and I need to inflict it on somebody else. So, uh, I figure you all have a high tolerance for boredom because you're in this talk, so suffer. <laughs> So the inter I did not shell out for the super drive, which is apparently the only way you can boot a CD on the MacBook Air. Uh, uh, you can't boot from a USB key. I don't know why. I assume it's some sort of firmware thing. Apparently that you can do this now, but uh, I, don't have, I didn't have a Linux box because I was sitting in my hotel room. <laughs> and I didn't have network access uh, once I did get uh, uh, the installer booting because the drivers didn't work. So. Uh, <laughs> So this is what I finally, there's a lot of, the many, 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 many other steps involved here, including a lot of cussing, so, uh, and giving up at 12.30 a.m. Anyway, so, this is how I ended up doing it. Uh, so I created a separate partition, uh, went and got the, um, this is the, the network installer uh, image. It's, it's uh, supposed, you're supposed to put it on your USB stick and boot from that, but as I mentioned, we can't do that. Uh, I downloaded it, so. I feel a little guilty about this. I downloaded the 64-bit install CD uh, on the conference network. <laughs> uh, I always feel, I've always thought, gosh, what are all these, you know, why do people think they need to like, download kernel trees whenever that at a, at a Linux conference? It's so rude and inconsiderate. Yeah, well, okay, I didn't have Linux on my machine I'm doing a Linux demo on, so. Uh, if, you're, <laughs> if your network was really slow in Urban Nest last night, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so um, I then put the CD image on a USB key. Remember, I can't boot from it. Uh, so I did this thing I called Franken boot. <laughs> so the, you can, uh, um, uh, you can, I could boot by getting this boot image on a partition, uh, but once it, it starts up, it wants to boot from the network. Uh, uh, it wants to, sorry, it wants to finish the install through the network, which as I mentioned, you know, we don't have any. So. Uh, uh, I, if I had had a Linux machine, I could have created a bootable image out of the CD. I did not have a Linux machine. So uh, what I did is I <laughs> just put in the, the, the um, uh, 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 syslinux configuration files and the initial RAM disk and the uh, kernel image onto the USB key image, and then I put it in a Linux partition, and then I use refit to boot it. So, okay, now I have an installer. <laughs> Uh, I'd, uh, fortunately, it asked me where the install media is located. I, I, it's actually on SDB. Woohoo, right? Except <laughs> uh, the wireless driver still doesn't work, and magically, I just figured out through the power of the internet that I needed to get this thing, uh, uh, some version of the Broadcam wireless drivers. <laughs> anyway, so here we are. <laughs> Uh, I think you probably came here for the easy kernel development with using more Linux talk, unless you came here for the other talk that was canceled uh, and uh, replaced with my talk on Monday. <laughs> so in case you think this is even more awful than usual, uh, I have some minor amount of excuse, although I probably would have waited till today to write the slides anyway. So that was a, that's all, uh, installing Linux is like, okay, I did need it, but it was a really, really excellent way to procrastinate. <laughs> So the cool thing about user mode Linux is that um, uh, you're just running a process on Linux. It, that, that's it. It's just like normal, hey, this is like a program that you're running. Whenever you compile uh, something, a C file, and you get, you know, and you run it, it's just a process. <laughs> so really, 
kernel development is now user space development. Uh, I know there's, it, it feels to me, I'm always trying to destroy the mystique of kernel development, like, oh, it's so hard. Uh, it, it's, okay, it sucks, it's hard, um, but it's not as hard as you think and it's not magic. And this really takes away, I think, a good chunk of the magic by saying that you can use wonderful things like GDB, yes. I tried to go find a quote about using GDB, something like, uh, I would rather poke my eyes out with, you know, seven razors dipped in lemon juice than use JDB, but I figured I could just make up my own like that. <laughs> yes, because the development environment on Linux is so incredibly awesome. Um, so I actually wrote up, was so annoyed with the process of getting UML running. Uh, UML is not the language, it's user mode Linux. Uh, but to me, that's what I think of when I see that. Uh, that I actually wrote up this web page a couple of years ago. Um, online, you can look at it. Uh, uh, it, that has uh, all this stuff on here. So if you want to go follow those instructions, you can go to that web page. Um, and I think it's like the first, you know, UML tips or something like that will get you that on Google. So the <laughs> part of why I wrote this page is that at the time, the user mode Linux uh, uh, website had a very large amount of documentation. And a very large amount of that documentation, I think uh, nearly 99% of it was out of date. And there's a whole lot of stuff about how to get the latest patches to make user mode Linux work. And then I realized about a day into that that actually mainline Linux worked now with uh, that, that uh, user mode Linux actually compiled and worked. So, so just go get the regular uh, source tree, you're fine. Um, this is the most important part of using user mode Linux. Usually when you're uh, compiling your, or doing anything interesting in the kernel tree, it automatically guesses your architecture. So. Uh, um, the, which is, of course, a, either 64-bit or 32-bit Intel, haha, -ha, right? But, you know, I've worked on PowerPC and stuff like that. So what you have to remember is to always tell it that your architecture is actually user mode Linux. Uh, you can edit this in the make file, uh, but that's gonna cause little spurious patches whenever you're doing diffs and things like that. So I prefer to just put it on the command line and just repeat it to myself a lot. Just don't forget, and when you forget, that's what you have to do to uh, uh, fix it. You have to delete every single uh, extraneous file. Um, <laughs> so, and that's very painful, and then you have to rebuild, entire, rebuild your entire tree, so just don't do that. Um, one of the things I did to reduce the pain of this, of making that mistake, is I put my output, I, I build with the output going to a separate, sort, uh, separate output tree. Um, so this, it doesn't build inside your source tree. So when you do a make MR proper inside your source tree, you don't get um, you don't have, because usually what I do is I forget to do anything at all, just type make, and I end up compiling in my source, my source tree, and then I can do make MR proper, and everything is better, so. Um, once you have your uh, uh, user mode Linux source tree down, you need to get a, a dot kernel config file. Um, uh, I, I put one up on that web page that you can use. It has things set, uh, for the most part, meaningfully. Um, you have to remember to use arch equal um whenever you're running menu config. Anything that involves make, you have to do that. So this is, if you're doing file systems development, this is the most important configuration option. Uh, without this, uh, whenever your machine crashes, the disk is in some sort of like undetermined state. It's like having a disk driver that doesn't actually write to the disk when it says it does. It, it just writes when it feels like it. So I had a number of like. Spur when I first started doing this, I had a number of spurious bugs. It's like, that's strange. It seems like these things are being written out of order. Oh, that's because they are. <laughs> so that was, that's uh, turned on in my configuration file. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, if, for most people, though, if you're not doing file system development, um, uh, you probably want to be using the hostfs. It's super easy. You just have a directory. You just point UML at it. Um, life is good. You can just edit your files directly and all that stuff. So, uh, but for the rest of us, that's not what we're gonna do. Uh, there's a bunch of cool stuff in kernel hacking that you should go and look at, and every time I look at it, there's something new and useful in there. So, uh, go take a look. All the, the stuff to do with like um, configure, or uh, debug memory allocations and things like that uh, is pretty cool. Um, so actually the most difficult part of running user mode Linux is getting a working root file system. Uh, this has become a lot easier over uh, uh, recently. There's like automatic tools to uh, uh, build one for you. Uh, the most recent one I built was um, uh, using Debian Bootstrap. 
uh, one of the things I, <laughs> it's been a super big pain for me during development is that I, uh, I've been switching back and forth between 32-bit and 64-bit laptops, and uh, you have to have a different, uh, different root file system if, uh, for both of those, so extremely irritating. Fedora has something, I don't know what. So I figured I could like edit this if somebody has the answer. You know, collaborative presentation making. All right, well, who likes Red Hat anyway? So, <laughs> so this is the part where you um, should not abuse the wireless network. <laughs> and I'm not sure what my bandwidth cap is for my, my hosting. That's about 170 megabytes. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you get home, maybe you could download it if you really want to do this. This has all of my um, union, union mount uh, project uh, uh, config, uh, development stuff on here. So, Union Mounts is this incredibly boring uh, Linux file system, VFS feature. So, uh, <laughs> if you find all this strange stuff on, on that uh, root file system, that's what it's about. Okay, so this is another <laughs> great way to waste an entire working day. Um, is that, uh, uh, so the root device for, if you're using one of these external images, uh, uh, instead of the host file system, the root device on, uh, you need to populate slash dev in your uh, uh, root file, uh, UML root file system. It wants, rather, so your normal Linux boots up with like slash dev SDA as the root file system. Um, I did, I, what I like to do is I like to not start anything complicated, like any demons at all in my user mode Linux uh, installation. So that's not, that would go through normally and, and populate uh, slash dev for you. So what you have to do is instead go mcnod uh, yourself explicitly. Uh, and this is a wonderful chain, a uh, little extra feature that recently the, the assumed naming changed uh, from one of these f formats to the other one. Great, okay. There's, you get really familiar with this particular error message <laughs> saying that uh, uh, user mode Linux can't m mount the root file system. It's like, ah, yes, for which reason this time? Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of reasons. Uh, so this is another reason why it's not mounting. <laughs> For some reason, I think the way that we normally type, it's like you always type ing, not ign. Uh, apparently, you always type uh, uh, udb instead of, or db instead of bd. I don't know if you can even tell the difference. I can't. It's like, even if you're not dyslexic, usually you'll become dyslexic, dyslexic with uh, b and d reversed like that. What's really hysterical about this is that UML now detects this and prints out a little message. Hey, you probably transposed these two letters. Would you like to check that out? And I just think it should be like, um, okay, we know what you meant and we're gonna transpose it for you, but whatever, at least it's got a message now, so. Um, this is how I remember. <laughs> you say block device. Block, but you, you see me sitting at the computer. UML block device, uh, nah, nah. okay, UBD. There we go. That's your mnemonic for today. So here's another. This is your next stumbling block for running user mode Linux. Um, theoretically, what you would do is you would, uh, once you've run make to create the image, what it does is it creates an executable named just plain Linux in the top level of your source directory. You could just run that thing, right? Right? Not so right. So uh, the way I usually run user mode Linux is under GDB, uh, that wonderful bastion of awesome debuggingness. Uh, it's uh, I run it with a, a set of commands automatically. Uh, this first one uh, tells it where to find the, um, this sets the kernel command line basically, it tells it where to find the, the uh, root file system image so that if I was running this in source Linux-26, I would then um, have in that directory a file named uml underbar root underbar image and that would get mounted uh, inside user mode Linux as a file system. RW says that it's just the kernel command line saying to mount the root file system, read write. It's not about to pop up. Uh, so the sig sig v thing <laughs> is extraordinarily irritating. Um, if you just run it, start GDB without this, you'll have um, uh, the process, po you'll have GDB, it'll drop into GDB every microsecond, you know, or something like that and say, gosh, I just got a signal, what should I do with it? Uh, it turns out that um, UML uses SIGSEGD, or at least it, in particular, it uses signals internally to emulate various things in the kernel. So um, uh, what you need to do is you need to tell GDB to ignore it. Um, otherwise, it's gonna try to get involved in everybody's business all the time. 
So uh, I usually use UML in this wonderful, awesome way. This really cuts down in your like um, booting time, your repeat time, how long it takes to, to test something new. Uh, uh, I like to, to just boot direct, set the init equal um, command line option so that it starts the test script immediately. It doesn't have to, it doesn't go through any of the init levels or, I mean, even init level one, it still tries to start services and ridiculous things like that. <laughs> Who needs those things? Um, so uh, I, uh, I tell it to just start my test script immediately. This other thing in here, UBD1, um, I, some of my tests need a, uh, uh, an ISO image, a, a CD image. So that's just another block device that it can use. Um, so we've got, we remember SIG SIGV from the last one. Uh, SIG user one is great. This is, uh, you, when I'm interested in something, which is usually when it's hanging, ha, huh, why is it hanging? Uh, I just send it SIG user one, it pauses, or it drops into GDB, and then I can do whatever I want. Um, Dash O says only send the, PKIL says find the thing with Linux in it, any process with Linux in it, and send it this um, signal, SIG user one, uh, and Dash O says only send it to the parent. Otherwise, you're gonna get like this, you know, UML has multiple threads running and you're gonna get all these different threads being unhappy. So. Great. <laughs> Ooh, 15 minutes in, that's wonderful. This talk's probably gonna end early unless you have a lot of questions, so. All right, so this is how I spent most of the last year and a half. No, coming up on two years now. This is what I looked at every day, okay. Hooray, uh, so there's my source tree. Um, let me look at my branches, because who knows where I am. Oh look, only one branch, that's so amazing. Huh, so I've been doing random hacking as a temporary commit, XXX. The ones before that are actually working. Implement union aware LSAT XADR. You know, uh, shell. That's really awesome and fun, cool, not really. <laughs> um, all right, so let's compile. Um, this says, uh, uh, the, the dash C part is not necessary at this point, but uh, so I'll just take it out. That just says that's where the source li is living, so. Doo, 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 doo. Oh, I'm running, I have Ccache installed too, so. Oh my gosh, it doesn't work. That never happens. Well, instead of debugging it here, I'm going to uh, check out, um, actually, I'm gonna go ahead and go to back, to branches back, so currently, or to um, change those paths. Compile, 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 compile. Usually at this point I get bored and I switch to the other window, but you know, it's not all that long. There we go, ta-da! Um, that's, and then uh, here's my, GDB. Uh, this, the um, touchpad is way too sensitive on this, so that's going to be annoying. Run. <laughs> There's a ton of debugging output on this. Ah, oh, it doesn't work. Oh, that never happens. Okay. Uh, so this is the where um, this is the the script that actually gets executed when it starts. This isn't the init equal whatever script. Here's a little. Uh, tour of my source base. I mean, this is I'm just, just trying to show you, it's kernel development. You can write a whole bunch of scripts and never have to type anything and never have to reboot anything, and it's just awesome. Okay, run tests, stage. Okay, so this says, this is the set of tests. This is, of course, some random, ridiculous, hacked together test suite, which is nonetheless um, in Git. Yay! <laughs> Tent commit for moving laptop, yes. Uh, I try not to check things in for, for good. Um, okay, uh, this, is, this is the best part, <laughs> I think. Uh, no need to shut down, just uh, control D. Oh, ah, this happens a lot. It's gonna complain, the, this is a stack trace, um, init died, that's, it's very unhappy about that. But that's much better than actually having to shut down, and the ben benefit of that is that it um, uh, does a dirty shutdown on your disk, so if you have some sort of bug in your file system, it's gonna show up, uh, where, where, whereas it wouldn't if you'd done a really nice shutdown. So that's my excuse. Really, I just never got it working, so. There you go. Oh, no, it works. Oh, no, still doesn't work, because this is, 
my life. <laughs> so this is a this is like um, well, part of what I point out like to point out here is that it takes like 20 seconds for this to compile. Um, doing oh yes, I forgot to rerun. I have to rebuild my test root image. So that's I don't know three seconds, and then it boots. Um, and then actually getting to the tests is like another two seconds, right? One, my tests are incredibly long. <laughs> so this, you can see it just, it just skipped the FS specific tests. Um, this part takes forever, uh, but I'm used to that too. So what I usually end up doing is heading over here, compiling something. Uh, so we're gonna try this because I happen to know that this sort of works. Um, I can go ahead and do this because the magic of Unix is such that the old file image is going to stay there um, and continue running. Uh, this is running off that uh, Linux uh, binary. This is going to replace it, but that's okay because the other one is still um, open. Uh, okay, I'm bored, I'm bored. Ha, huh. die. Yes, okay. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn back on these tests because I got them working. I'm going to, I started running make from here because you don't want to overwrite your UML disk image while it's mounted. So that way I have to actually not be running in UML before I can rebuild the image. So there's a ton of debugging output. So success, 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 success. I did, there aren't any uh, existing uh, tests for um, uh, ext2 correctly handling, handling directory entries because we just got it one, right like 10 years ago and just nobody ever broke it. But that was very inconvenient to, for me. So, all right. So that's my. Um, I never rebooted anything. I, uh, I never. You know, I think this is a huge advantage over doing VMware or any sort of entire virtual machine, Quimu or anything like that, uh, because. Let me just go back to this because this is super boring. All right. There we go. Um, uh, if you, everyone knows how to do VMware and things like that, but the thing is, is that you don't need to emulate every hardware instruction in order to emulate enough to do a lot of interesting uh, development in Linux. So this is much faster. It's much smaller. Um, the uh, the, U, the root image I have is, is way bigger than it needs to be. It's really around, uh, I don't know, 200 megabytes, something like that. Um, you don't have to set, reserve any memory. You don't, it's, it's just hugely that much easier and faster. So I can do a, uh, I can test a new kernel uh, in like 30 seconds so, um, until I get to the part where I actually run my tests. And usually what I do is I move the tests that I'm, I'm working with up to the beginning of my test scripts and then I run it right away. So getting that um, uh, change, compile, test cycle down to as, as few seconds as possible is vital to making, uh, making things work. So, uh, so I <laughs> really threatened to teach you a little bit about the VFS. Um, I'm only gonna do a little bit of, of complaining about one, of, one particular stumbling block to VFS development. Um, uh, VFS is the virtual file system layer in Linux. It's what's on, what's on top of all of the file systems. So um, <laughs> the first reason you, why there might not be very many people working on the VFS is that it's super, super boring, very, very boring, but also kind of complicated. And something I'm not going to put down on the slide is that you know, perhaps some of the VFS de developers are a reason why you wouldn't want to work on the VFS. So. <laughs> I'm really bitchy some days. Um, no, uh, well, yes. <laughs> but I think this is the real reason why nobody wants to work in the VFS. Strict name my data. I remember first encountering uh, oh, four years ago and, be, and thinking, what is this? I don't get it. And so I spent a few months being like, ah, I don't know, I don't know, and reading the documentation. And I realized nobody else got it either. Nobody. So, struct name my data. This is this is uh, is a collection of random pointers to stuff that you might need later on. It's like the world's biggest stupid. Here, there's more. Check it out. There's a union. Open intent. Nobody knows what open intent is. We just know that if you don't pass it around, sometimes you get kernel panics. You know, it's uh, I, this is <laughs> it, the, I, I have 
you know, if I were to be locked up in prison for five years, what I would do is I would fix that. Now, not referring to anyone in particular, uh, I would remove name I data from the kernel and that would get me, make me a lot of friends. So like this thing right here, um, uh, path is like points, uh, the qster last, right? This is something you need to like free at random points. And um, yeah, it's like an object oriented programmer's nightmare. Okay, so. Excellent, we've got lots and lots and lots of time to be early. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, along with Mary Gardner, uh, we're found, I'm founding a, uh, the Ada Initiative, which sort of sounds like a really cool uh, Angelina Jolie movie, which involves like some spies running around and things like that, and you know, like the Bourne Conspiracy, the Ada Initiative, yeah, cool. Unfortunately, there's uh, no rappelling off buildings or high heels or anything like that. We're just getting more women involved in open source. Uh, and specifically, we want to get them involved in open source careers. Um, the, the best way to be involved in open source is to have somebody be paying you to do it. Uh, it's always best to be enjoying what you do and um, making a living at the same time. So, um, Mary Gardner is kind enough to do this with me and save me. <laughs> and the question we, we're working on this week uh, is figuring out, so there's been about 10 years of, of uh, 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 women, uh, women in open source activism of various sorts done entirely on a volunteer basis. And Mary and I, are, what's, what's our estimate of how many hours we've total spent? I don't know, over 10 years, 20 hours a week. A lot of, I don't know, that's many, many hours. 1,000, 10,000 probably. Uh, and all of that ends up, <laughs> you know what, You'll, people will always say, yes, totally support you working on this thing. But when it comes to your annual review, Somehow, this never seems to get on there. So we're looking to see what we can do. There's a, a bunch of projects that you just can't do unless you have someone who can concentrate on them. You know, either it just takes sustained effort or it just really sucks and you're not gonna do it unless you're getting paid to do it. It's a usual problem with volunteer work. Um, but we think that we could make a significant difference uh, if, if we had full-time people working on this. So what we're, here's a sample of the kind of projects we're thinking about doing. Uh, one of these is, is uh, first patch week. Uh, it's a little bit inspired by um, uh, Canonical's BZR team. Uh, they have a concept of a patch pilot where, and this is the important part, each person spends one week out of five um, with their primary responsibility to uh, uh, see patches that go to the mailing list and work with the people who sent the patches to get them actually integrated. The important part is that that's their number one priority for that week, instead of being what you do after you get everything else done, which of course it's never done, so you never actually go and help people with their patches. Um, this, so this would be a uh, uh, getting certain companies to participate and say, okay, we pledge this week, we're gonna put as these set of employees uh, uh, on uh, first patch duty, we're gonna line them up with people who want to do patches. Uh, often what people say to me at this point is, oh, well, I don't know if there's a bug that's easy enough for someone to pick up in a week and, and finish. And I agree, all those good bugs we fix because we're busy avoiding fixing the hard bugs. So instead we'd have specific projects um, more or less um, uh, symbolic or important or difficult. Uh, so don't worry about having actual bugs that someone can fix in a week. Um, uh, we're thinking about a project, uh, an open source project scorecard. We can go through and say, um, uh, have some, some sort of standards or metrics for um, uh, how friendly they are to new contributors, how well the documentation is done, um, whether you have pro <laughs> uh, uh, prominent or frequent inc incidences of people being total jerks, uh, specifically to women, but also in general. One of, the, one of our, th our set, our theories is that uh, if you fix the things that make it difficult for women to be involved in open source, you're gonna fix the things that make it difficult for everybody to be involved in women or in, in women in open source. Everybody would love to be involved in women in open source, for everyone to be involved in open source. So um, uh, whatever changes we make or, or things we notice are going to benefit everyone. Um, uh, and our third, a third project is uh, 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 basically providing a consulting service. You know, people walk up and uh, uh, say, uh, gosh, I would love to help. Uh, I would love to have more women developers in my company. What do I do? I know, I'll print a pink t-shirt, you know, and like, well, uh, that can be one element of a well-coordinated strategy, but no. <laughs> so we could, uh, we could at least help people with understanding 
the, the basics of, of what not to do. And with uh, some work, we can perhaps have a, a, a help people have a successful women in open source outreach program from the beginning, instead of figuring it out as you go, as we have for the last 10 years. Um, so at this particular time, um, we're looking for project suggestions. Uh, measurable goals are very difficult. <laughs> Uh, there aren't any numbers right now. Probably one of our measurable goals is to simply create, uh, t do an initial survey um, of the state of women in open source at this point, um, and fundraising contacts. So this is like not, hey, you should talk to Microsoft <laughs> about getting money, but I know this person, specific person at the Microsoft open source office who controls the budget for um, trying to look like we don't totally want to destroy Linux, you know, that sort of thing. So. Um, that's, please email us. This will go to both Mary and I. So, um, and I think that's it. Questions? Uh, I'd like to just ask about the, um, what, what, how, how to get companies involved in actually uh, s supporting initiatives to get more women. I mean, um, company managers often seem to be, well, if it doesn't, if it, doesn't directly involve earning more money, then why should I be interested? So how, how do you get companies interested in, in, having, in supporting having more women um, in, involved in working in open source? Uh, it's interesting to me because, uh, so it's interesting to me because I'm always surprised by how supportive um, people are, especially in management of this kind of projects. Uh, uh, you, uh, a lot of companies and, and managers seem pretty no-nonsense and like they're not going to be interested in anything that doesn't directly result in revenue. But when you actually talk to people frequently, they discover, or you discover that they're actually extremely interested uh, in helping women in open source. They just don't know how. Uh, so I, I, our, uh, my particular philosophy is not to go around trying to convince people who are not convinced already, but to find the people who are very interested. One of the things I'm finding is that uh, there's a demographic change going through open source right now. Uh, a, a lot of people are having kids, and a lot of those kids are, are girls. And a lot of those girls are hitting the age when um, their parents are saying, hey, I'd love for you to be interested in computers too. But strangely, you don't seem to be interested, and everyone mocks you at school when you <laughs> say that you use Linux. Uh, and that, that's suddenly like an awareness thing that, oh, I can't share this thing that I love um, with my daughter. So. Um, how much access to the hardware do you have with user mode Linux, i.e. can you use it for hardware device drivers? Uh, so user mode Linux, there's a, a line that it's useful for kernel development above that line and not below that line. So basically user mode Linux emulates uh, uh, all devices. It just, it just uh, uses, um, you know, if, it, if, it's ha if, if it's faking up a disk, it just opens up a file underneath it on, on Linux. So if you want to do, um, there's actually, Christoph Hellig did, I think, two years ago at LCA, a talk on how to do PCI driver development in Quimu. So you'd, you'd want to go to an, a lower level of um, emulation for that. There's, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do any Ethernet driver work or anything like that in it. Mine's actually a bit of an addition to that one. Um, what about SMP? I realise, as per the talk a couple of days ago, we had, you know, SMP is pretty much the solved problem, but how does that work with UML? I have no idea, so I'm going to look at the configuration. Not something I've thought about. What is it doing? Is it doing the wrong thing? Uh, yes, right. I think it's single-threaded. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't think if you're doing SMP work, UML is not for you. I've stunned them into silence, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> do you mind if we go with the new person first? And then we'll do follow-up in a second. So. Queuing theory. <laughs> um, the test cases uh, that you were running were just like in your init script, is it? I guess it's still possible to have an interactive session, so if you do want oh, to just have a shell and be doing stuff? Yeah, it ends in a shell. 
So oh, so that I, shell is in the pretend Linux. Oh, sorry, in the user <laughs> mode Linux. Pretend Linux, I like that. Uh, la la la, where do I do this? Um, I'm sorry? Sure. Uh, so this is this is drop into a shell so we can fiddle around. That's where I do it. Um, uh, -da. <laughs> ah, yes. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I don't know why I did release. I have no idea. Is it? Oh yeah, three. Well, that uh, really three cores. That's very odd. Um, I usually do. Yeah, I think you have to do, go do that. That's like over here in the setup script. <laughs> oh gosh, you know, this is so funny, right? right, right? You're like, you should always write comments even if you think no one will ever see this. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, this, this is exciting. Um, I had to do add a user for something and of course I decided I would no, didn't want to ever do it twice, so. Is there a, a, a like a, a bunch of test suites for for the kernel? I mean, uh, are you a, are you a, a brave lone ranger writing these scripts to uh, do these tests on the kernel, or have other people? Are there a bunch of other scripts somewhere that um, uh, can be used to test other aspects of the kernel's operation? There are uh, many scripts somewhere. Uh, which is a really, I think, excellent description of it. So, um, generally, I'll, I'll get to you in, in one sec. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I, I just want to give the general theory of kernel testing, which is that every so often someone says, we should really have a kernel test suite, and they create a kernel test suite, and then nobody adds tests to it, and then it dies. Um, and so there's multiple these, of these lying around. Right now, the current iteration of that for file systems is XFS tests. And what I really ought to do, but I have not done, of course, is move all of these tests into um, XFS tests and then just run that, uh, have this be part of it. But I haven't done this. Oh, the other, the other one, of course, is LTP, the Linux test project. So that's got you know, IBM and it's lots of people involved. It's, it's very active. I don't think it goes specifically to a lot of file system tests, but um, it's a really good way of stressing the kernel. It, you know, it tries to call you know, system calls with invalid argument combos and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, check out LTP. Yeah, there's like FS fuzzer and things like that. I mean, there's a bunch of random stuff all over there, but it's the usual problem with test frameworks that, yeah, you know, they aren't quite right for you. It's just easier for you to write your own scripts, which have much better comments and run faster. So, all right, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone, for and coming. No, we still have time for a oh. few more questions. And there's um, <laughs> one up there. Sorry, I'm not going to let no, you no, off yet. Everyone be, oh, crap. <laughs> um, would you like to talk to us about um, the union and file system stuff you've been doing? Please. <laughs> I would not particularly like to, but I can uh, do. Uh, do you have anything in mind like current status or? Uh, so. Um, Union Mounts is a, a, a project to basically replace UnionFS and AUFS with something that could ever possibly be conceived of being merged into mainline. Uh, I, uh, it's, I did some new stuff which makes it possible, I think. I even applied for a patent on one of them so um, for Red Hat so it's open to GPL software and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so there's, it's, it's, it's new. If it fails, it'll fail in a new and different way than the previous efforts. Uh, in, uh, in this direction. Um, I've been working on it for about a year and a half. I took it over from uh, Jan Blunk, who worked on it for a couple of years, uh, that which is, you know, uh, the, the people have been working on this general, general problem for about 17 years. Uh, it's, I've done two, two in-person code reviews with Alviro, which is, I mean, it's hard to tell that he ever doesn't detest the entire world, but he actually was really positive and had a good time uh, reviewing things. It was stunning. I was just, I've never seen anyone who could pick up code so quickly and just be right all of the time. So, so he has looked at it, but um, you know, everybody's got their priorities and I think the, uh, it's 
still just not up there. So where I am right now on it is um, I'm doing an ext2 cleanup, <laughs> as you can see over here, um, uh, with my my branch. Um, yeah. So. Uh, just to show that you can implement, you can make the, the idea is I'm, I'm pushing a little bit of the ugly into the underlying file system. If I can show that you can do this incredibly cleanly and beautifully in ext2, it'll be a lot more convincing uh, that it's just not going to be a huge overhead for um, all the other file systems. So, uh, but I decided to stop working on that full time and start working on um, the ADA initiative uh, because I feel it's more pressing and also because at this point what I really need to do is get Alvero to actually uh, uh, take a look at it and start banging on it a little more. So, so I'm, it's in maintenance mode. It's like my 10% time project. Um, and people always bug me and ask me about it, but <laughs> you know, I do what I can do, so. All right, great. Now really stunned into silence. Uh, one question uh, um, about <laughs> wom <laughs> woman in Linux. Um, sure. Stats from a UQ introductory programming course, there were 256 men and um, <laughs> under 50 women. Um, most of them were reluctantly doing it because it's compulsory in the multimedia course. Um, <laughs> wouldn't you need more women coming into university doing IT before you can get them developing in Linux? Uh, yes, so um, what there has been one report on the number of, of women involved in uh, Linux in any you know, measurable way uh, and that comes out to somewhere between 1% and 5%. In the um, closed source computer programming uh, world in general, or over all computer programming in general, that number is more like 20 to 30%. Uh, my particular feeling is that open source is far more influential and visible than closed source. You know, all the reasons that we love open source and are working on it instead of some private project that'll get canceled and our, all our code will be thrown away instead of you know, some project that you'll work on for several years. I put your code on the internet and nobody will read. You know, it's a very, very important difference. Uh, but I am perfectly happy to steal women from closed source at this point. Um, we're focusing on late college, early career women, um, simply because that's kind of what we remember or we've always been at that stage or I don't know, something like that. Uh, I would be interested at some point in trying to, to get women into open uh, computer science programs early in college, like the first year of college, uh, by pointing out that there is this other alternate route which involves getting flown to Australia for free uh, and drinking a lot of very expensive alcohol. So that's a, <laughs> which I don't really do anymore. But, um, but that there's all of these wonderful, fun advantages to working on open source that you just don't get if you're in some programmer dungeon inside of IBM. Unless there's any more questions, I think we could fit another one in. No? no. Can we you We're all? Done. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> We're done then. Oh. A 20-year-old you know. <laughs> problem that's like almost intractable. It's an enormous boil the ocean style issue. You're talking about union mounts, right? <laughs> yes, um, because I think this is project Al is Is Alviro like, he cares that much about women in open source that he won't accept your patch? <laughs> perhaps, perhaps that's an, uh, he has a young daughter. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I decided that this would be easier than getting any form of unioning file system actually merged into Linux, so we'll see. <laughs> okay, we might put all our hands together for our speaker.